you, Will, and thank you so much for to everyone for coming tonight. We're really excited, and as Will said, this is the first time that uh, the Science Exchange has been open for a really long time. So thank you for joining us. I am Dr. Sophie Calabretto. I am the host of the Science Briefing. I think it was advertised tonight that we would welcome you to six ideas that are changing the world. And in fact, there are going to be seven. So you get an idea for free, which is fantastic. <laughs> I am joined by the fabulous Cosmos Science Newsroom. So before we ask them about their ideas that are going to change the world and unpack some of those, I'd like to very briefly introduce them. So we have Jacinta Bola. Can wait. Oh, yeah. Hi. <laughs> Emma Perfetto. Hello. Evram Yazgan. Hi. Petra Stock. Claire Kenyon. Hi. Ellen Fidian Hi. and Matt Aegis. Hi. So to kick us off, the question that we're asking, what is your idea that changes the world? And I want to throw to you first, Evram, because I think you're going to talk about machine learning, which is something that we all know a little bit about, but maybe not as much as we need to. Yeah, machine learning, artificial intelligence, call it what you like. Um, to begin with, uh, in 2020, uh, just to give you a picture, there were 40 zettabytes of data recorded on the internet. Uh, and a zettabyte is about a trillion gigabytes. So it's a lot. Uh, and with this in mind, machine learning, which feeds off data, uh, is inevitably going to be changing our lives as we go forward. Um, whether it be through self-driving vehicles, climate modeling, or even in healthcare. The most powerful computer that we know of is the human brain. So machine learning tools seek to imitate the complex uh, neuron, uh, sorry, neural complexes that exist in our brains uh, to try and learn through the input of massive amounts of data um, about patterns uh, and through that pattern recognition to, to make predictions and so on. Um, one thing which we have to get out of the way, though, is the name artificial intelligence is a bit of a misnomer. These things are not intelligent. At least not, <laughs> definitely not. Um, at least not in the way that you or I are intelligent. Well, I would hope. Um, I actually uh, recently spoke with some uh, machine learning uh, researchers down at uh, Monash University in what's called Sensor Lab. Um, these people are working on machine learning in relationship to um, artistic endeavors and design. And they were very quick to say, uh, that these machine learning tools that they're using are not creative. They will not replace human artists. Um, nor did they say that the machines are sentient in any way. There is no robot-driven apocalypse coming, so we can <laughs> relax about that. Um, machine learning is there to complement humans. Uh, they are faster at certain tasks, but their role uh, is to complement human intuition and our own experience. Thank you, Ebram. So before we get into the Q&A, because I've got some questions, <laughs> um, I'm going to throw to Emma, our citizen scientist. Yeah, so I guess if you haven't ever heard of citizen science before, it's this really, really cool phenomenon where general public, people like maybe you and I, who don't have a formal scientific training, uh, can become actively involved in scientific research. So um, citizen science has been around for over 100 years in some capacity, but in the past couple of decades, it's really exploded uh, due to the advent of things like the internet and new technologies like handy smartphones. And that's really you know, increased the number and diversity of projects that are out there that people can get involved in, you know, whether that's uh, heading around your neighbourhood and snapping a picture of a, um, you know... Piece of wildlife. I hope that's not me, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, taking down notes of when you see wildlife and reporting that, or if you just want to stay at home on your computer, um, you can head onto the internet and maybe have a look at some cool pictures of galaxies and, you know, catalogue their shapes and what kinds that they are. And um, I think in Australia there's over 500 different types of citizen science projects that you can be involved in. So give it a Google if you're interested. Um, there are some handy websites that you can look at to 
to find ones that you can get involved in. But for science and science going forward, citizen science really is this opportunity to do science that maybe wouldn't have been possible without the help of citizen scientists. You know, we maybe don't have the funding or the manpower, people power, I should say, to go out and get the kinds of data that we need or even to analyse and collate that data. So uh, citizen science is really uh, exciting for scientific research going forward. Thank you, Emma. Next, Petra is going to talk to us about social robots. I have no idea what that means. What is a social robot? So, everyone said um, there's no robot-driven apocalypse coming. <laughs> <laughs> I beg to differ. <laughs> because the idea that I think is going to change the world are social and service robots. Um, and what they are, are are robots that are coming into human environments, our homes, our workplaces, and in many cases interacting with us. Um, there are something like, um, there were 23 million service robots in 2019 and that number has only grown since the pandemic in all sorts of ways. Um, behind this kind of explosion of these social robots is um, some the AI developments that have happened, um, also progress that we've made in energy storage and efficiency, um, lower cost methods of manufacturing. Um, so kind of like Star Wars, <laughs> uh, we're now beginning to see robots, um, you know, performing tasks like delivering goods, um, stock taking in retail, medical support, cleaning, even security, a bit like a Dalek. Um, oh my and also companionship. Um, you might have seen robots. Um, I know in Australia there are robot waiters that are becoming more prominent. You might have a robot vacuum cleaner in your house. Um, or even smart speakers is sort of a step along the way to, um, to those kinds of social robots. Um, so I really think that social robots are going to change our cities, they're going to change our home and professional lives, and I think there are really interesting implications for both human-robot interactions, but also um, what those interactions then mean for our relationships with one another. It's interesting you say that, Petra, because I actually got served dumplings by a robot on the weekend, so I already have embraced social robots and I had no idea. Next, we have Jacinta. You're going to talk to us about the Internet of Energy, and I also don't think I know what that means. Yeah, I feel like everyone kind of understands what it is, but no one really knows what it is. Well, let's assume that all of these things that we've got here are going to need energy. Um, they're probably quite energy intensive. Um, so here in South Australia, I feel like we're all very well aware of the intricacies between like different types of renewable energy or the benefits of battery powered storage. Thanks, Musk. <laughs> um, but with climate change already here, we not only need to be changing the way we create and store energy, preferably as soon as possible, um, but also how we use it. So this idea is called the Internet of Energy, although we at Cosmos have been calling it the uh, energy democracy, which I really like. <laughs> um, this change would actually radically change the way that we use energy. So right now, I expect that I can just turn on my light and it will have energy, or my dishwasher works when I turn it on, um, and there'll be enough energy in the grid to make that happen. Now, we're not talking about like <laughs> having dishwashers that don't work or anything like that. Um, but renewable energy isn't a resource that we can easily turn on and off with demand, like we do with coal. Instead, the Internet of Energy suggests that appliances in your home would be able to tell you the best time to run your dishwasher because the sun is shining or there's less demand for resources. So the system will probably still need like green hydrogen or another type of energy resource to plug the gap. But if we as consumers, or at least our electronics, were more in tune with when there's plentiful, cheap, and green energy available, the gap can be much smaller than it currently is. There you go. Next, Claire. 
Hello. space, the final frontier. <laughs> oh, well, I'm going to narrow it down a little bit and say that I believe that the search for life outside of Earth will absolutely make a difference to the world. Um, I would actually argue it already has. Um, we've already seen incredible advances in technology, you know, engineering, instrumentation, core sciences, that's already happening. Uh, we listed out for signals indicating intelligent life and we have been guilty of sending some out ourselves, although I would argue, is that intelligent? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> we scour the skies for exoplanets, looking for just telltale signs that there are planets like us. And in fact, you know, right now there's almost 5,200 confirmed exoplanets and there's thousands of ones that have been detected but not confirmed. I mean, seriously, isn't that changing your life? We send probes that photograph and probe and sample other planets and moons in our own solar system and we are pushing the boundaries of what we know. We actually use pretty much everything we've already heard about. We've got AI, we've got machine learning, we've got citizen science, we've got energy, we've got robots. <laughs> <laughs> but what can we expect for the future? Well, it really depends on what we find, right? If we find life, or if it finds us first, we can probably expect that we need to totally rewrite the books on biology, technology, chemistry, physics, maths, whatever. Name it. It's going to have to change. We'll probably need to start thinking about ethical and legal frameworks. If we don't find it, what does that mean? Are we special? Or is it actually that our singular evolutionary path is ultimately doomed? No matter what, the search for life beyond Earth will also inevitably give us better information about how we might be able to move into it ourselves. We currently don't have a planet B. Perhaps we might eventually be the life outside of Earth. I saw Mars attacks once, so now I'm worried. I've got some questions. <laughs> Ellen, you're going to talk to us about the nanometer. Yeah, so from something extremely big to something <laughs> extremely small. Um, a nanometer is a billionth of a metre, it's a millionth of a millimetre. I think it's a really important unit of measurement. If we're talking atoms, they're kind of a tenth to a fifth of a nanometer, depending on how you measure them. Bacteria, maybe one or two micrometres, so a couple of thousand nanometres. When we're talking nanometers, we're talking molecules, big and small, and the way atoms move together. And it's an important unit of measurement because it's going to change the way, or it has already changed health and energy and computing, and it will continue to do so. The biggest example of the recent, in recent years is COVID vaccines. The mRNA COVID vaccines, lipid nanoparticles of 50 to 150 nanometers in size, which get into our cells, um, and then provoke our immune system, hopefully. Novavax, similarly, 20 nanometers. Um, computing is another really big issue. So the current industry, industry standard for a, micro, for a transistor is five nanometers. Last year, some US and Taiwanese scientists announced that they'd managed to make one that was one nanometer in size. So five silicon atoms lined up, pretty much. Um, the smaller you can get them, the more powerful you can, can make a computer, but we know that there's got to be a lower limit on this, so it's something that we have to think about. A lot of this falls in the realm of nanotechnology. I've had a lot of really interesting conversations about changing surfaces to repel bacteria or to make things more energy efficient, particularly batteries and hydrogen production, which Jacinta, which Jacinta touched on. Um, but also a lot of people who work at the scale of nanometers would never call themselves nanotechnologists. DNA is two and a half nanometers in diameter. Figuring out how to sequence that and learn more about it is absolutely crucial to our understanding of health and our understanding <coughs> of ecology. Um, so I think a nanometer is a really important scale and it's one we're going to be working on for the next at least three, four decades. Amazing. And last but not least, Matt. Resilience. Yeah, well, um, I should say straight off the bat that it was quite audacious of you to say, you know, you actually do have seven things about um, ideas that will change the world because you only have six. Um, because my topic is about the fact that rather than an idea to change the world, we have to look at it in the sense that the world is changing or has changed and we need to come up with ideas to address that. And of course, I'm referring to things like climate change and the onset potentially of more zoonotic disease related pandemics 
um, and a range of other things as well. But those are obviously the big two in the room when it comes to things that we need to mitigate for, that we need to build resilience for, and that we need to be able to adapt to. And I think what we've seen in this pandemic um, is at first a lot of coordination, a lot of people on the same page to begin with, and then the moment a vaccine appears on the scene, we start to see the undermining of institutions, we start to see the undermining of science and, and what I think many of the people in this room would have assumed is accepted science and that is related to the development of vaccines and the efficacy of vaccines and the importance of vaccines. And unsurprisingly now we're starting to see low uptake of vaccines in general and things like polio starting to come back. So um, clearly uh, there is importance in science and what we have with issues like climate change uh, and, and issues like um, potentially more pandemics uh, is the importance of being able to be resilient against those going forward. We're starting to see potentially greater climactic events taking place and hazardous events taking place. If you're living in a place like Lismore um, in the last few years, you've been hit by multiple flooding events and that has created economic impacts, health impacts, and you know, to, to an extreme level, people starting to question whether or not a place like Lismore should even be inhabited because if this is what we're gonna see more of, that we have IPCC science and reports coming out saying these are worst case scenarios, that these are the things that we need to be able to mitigate against and whatever actions that may involve, mostly from a government level, it's important that we start to consider what those actions are gonna be and begin to implement them. IPCC reports, um, for those of you who aren't aware what that is, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, produces reports, um, I think every, you know, nearly every decade, and ultimately um, that comes up with a, a range of climate science um, related, uh, I've got someone waving at me up there and I'm terribly distracted by it because I know I'm going over. But basically, <laughs> um, in essence, what that does is predict that we're gonna, here's, here's what we know with high confidence is gonna happen in a 1.5 to three degree warming scenario. At this rate, our trajectory is over three degrees. So we need to start talking about actions that are gonna mitigate and adapt to that particularly warm world. And that's why mitigation and adaptation to the future is particularly important as an issue. Thank you, Matt. So um, now to get things rolling, my job is being a question asking contrarian. And this all sounds great, but I have some concerns. <laughs> so what I wanna to do to start off with is talk about any potential challenges that we think these ideas might face. And I wanna flip it a little bit. Claire, I wanna start with you. You talked about space. Shouldn't we be focusing on our own planet? I feel social. There are a lot of social issues here that we might need to deal with. Well, thanks, Matt. It's really good to follow on from that, and thanks, Sophie. Um, <laughs> you can just dive right in. <laughs> Absolutely. Great question. Why are we spending fuel, money, time, effort on looking out when you know we look around and we do kind of see a bit of a mess? Um, first of all, my first argument: it's not one or the other. Actually, it's not one or the other. It is not a dichotomy. But I'm going to throw some numbers at you too. Give you some weight there. I love numbers. Great, we are seeing James Webb's first telescope took us 30, 40 years to get up there. It's ten billion dollars. Uh, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial extraterrestrial. Oh god. Um, extraterrestrial <laughs> intelligence. Uh, look, NASA had their own version of that. Uh, in 1993, it was canned. It was costing ten million dollars a year, and I expect it's at least that much at the moment. Uh, interestingly enough, the SETI at the moment is being funded by mostly private. Um, people. So names like Arthur C. Clarke, <laughs> Yuri Milner, uh, William Hewitt, which to me didn't mean anything until the next name, David Packard, came along. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> then we've got the Breakthrough Initiatives, right? We've got Breakthrough Listen, uh, which is basically scanning the galactic plane of the Milky Way, looking for messages from a thousand or so stars and the closest 100. And then there's Breakthrough Starshot, which is sending these tiny little nanosails off to Alpha Centauri and at the time at, at, with, the, with a laser to point them and to send them on their way at like, mm, I don't know, 100 million miles an hour. I was going to put that in kilometres, but it definitely sounds better in miles. <laughs> um, that's about 20 years. So potentially they could get there and beam back, right? Great. Sounds really good. But what about the numbers? You know, breakthrough costs $100 million. It's not one or the other. And a lot of these things are, well, not the breakthrough project so much, but a lot of them, like James Webb, actually piggyback on other things. So James Webb's main job isn't necessarily to be up there looking for life. It's actually just one of the things that he's doing, categorising atmospheres in exoplanets. And I would argue it's actually kind of important. Also, many of them bring about huge technological advances to humanity. SETI alone has brought up 
communications that we've, has come up with new ways to communicate on Earth. Right? Our search out there is helping us down here. On a more basic level, I've got two points. If we don't spend the cash, Sophie, we'd be in pretty big trouble <laughs> if they came and visited us. Because chances are, they're probably more advanced than we are. Uh, and yeah, Mars attacks. attacks. Yeah, yeah, Mars attacks, right? So NASA and the US government now are seriously looking at reports from military at, at these things, UAPs. We're not allowed to call them UFOs anymore, guys. We are in control. It's UAPs. Okay. Clay, I'm just going to jump in now because I've got a lot of questions and we don't yeah. have that much time. That's I want to throw right. to Petra really quickly. Yeah, cool. Social robots, I feel like there are social problems with these social <laughs> robots. <laughs> well, there are, and part of it's because of us, because for most of us, what we know about robots doesn't come from science, it comes from science fiction. So, you know, the Jetsons or Doctor Who <laughs> or Star Wars or whatever it is. Um, and the problem with that is that people tend to um, overestimate robots. They attribute them intention where there is none. Um, they assume they, in some cases, are human-like. Um, and that causes all sorts of problems. For example, uh, there was the recent example of the chess-playing robot that broke the child's finger because, <laughs> and everyone said, oh, it's never done that before. <laughs> and, it you know, on social media, everyone was saying, well, it just didn't want to lose. And <laughs> it just really hated that one particular <laughs> kid. <laughs> because what happens is that the way we think about robots also changes the you know, society in general. For example, if we, um, if we deploy a whole lot of female gendered robots into um, what has stereotypically been female roles, for example, smart speakers are all basically women secretary types, um, that can harden stereotypes, for example. Um, yeah, 100%. Again, I'm still a little bit caught up on the, the social implications of these things. Matt, clearly there's a bunch of social implications when we talk about resilience. Yeah, I mean, if we don't, um, you know, prevent the worst things from happening, like, worst things will be happening to us. So there are some significant social implications. I guess, you know, what people tend to think about, and this is probably one of the considerations when it comes to, to social challenges with issues like climate change or a pandemic, um, is that we only tend to, I think, um, consider the issue through our own prism, you know, our own experience, whether that's me as an individual, or me and my neighbours, or me and my country. But the pandemic's actually done a really good job of showing the social injustices that can be in play with these huge macro scale events like a pandemic and potentially climate change. And that is that uh, the global north, um, previously known as the developed world, um, has an advantage. It has more money, it has more resourcing, it can create its own vaccines, it can you know, spend the money to mitigate against potential hazardous events. But we know that the global south, which previously referred to as the developing world, are in environments that are, um, or in parts of the world that are more susceptible to hazardous events from climate change. And in the case of a pandemic, doesn't necessarily have the funding or the facility to manufacture vaccines. So. When it comes to social issues, it's sort of, um, you know, blended in with, with ethical issues as well, and that is at what point does the Global North start to consider the implications that its actions are having for the Global South? Because by and large, it's the, the developed world that is um, disproportionately polluting the planet and is also spending a lot of time making sure its own populations are vaccinated. Um, we have a lot of surplus of vaccines that aren't getting used right now, and some countries in the global south have barely, you know, vaccinated one of the populations, of which many of these countries have quite substantial populations. So certainly there are definite social and ethical considerations when it comes to it. I'm really glad you brought up ethical issues, Matt, because every I have issues with AI. Are there, are there any ethical challenges that you might see with the future of machine learning? Absolutely, there, there are plenty. And you know, to, to go to Petra's point, I, I take the point that you know, there are dangers. The dangers are real when it comes to these you know, machine learning tools that we're beginning to implement. And 
I wanted to focus on one particular area, which is artificial intelligence in healthcare. Um, I mean, obviously, healthcare, the Hippocratic Oath, the, the first rule is do no harm. Uh, and yet, we have examples where artificial intelligence tools have been uh, employed which were meant to help aid in, in clinical um, uh, healthcare, uh, but have actually done the opposite. Um, an early tool, and it must be, you know, it, it was early. Um, in the 1990s was used in mammograms um, to, to look at mammograms and try and identify breast cancer nodules uh, in, the, in the mammograms. Um, this was uh, deemed as safe and used on hundreds of thousands of women in the United States. Uh, 25 years later, there was a, a study done which analyzed the performance of the AI and found that it actually done more harm than good. Um, uh, another example, just stepping outside slightly, the, the healthcare uh, sphere. Um, an algorithm was used and unfortunately is still used uh, in some court proceedings in the United States to test recidivism. That is, um, when someone commits a crime, the likelihood that they will uh, recommit um, or, or commit another crime. Um, and it was found that it had uh, a racial bias and it was uh, more often wrong when it came to African-American individuals. Um, another point is that there is currently no AI training uh, of any real sense for healthcare professionals. Um, but just to give a sort of more positive twist, there are ways in which this can be improved. Um, one of them is certainly legislation. Um, an example of, of where the definite improvement needs to be um, put forward is um, there are currently 350 um, AI tools on the market, but only five of them have gone through clinical trials. So certainly more, more tr clinical trials and um, more clear guidelines on what exactly should be put on the market are necessary. And there are areas where AI has been shown, even in healthcare, to provide definite benefits. Um, you know, it's been uh, proven to be very useful in finding um, lung cancer nodules. Um, earlier this year, I spoke with scientists working on uh, using AI tools in uh, traumatic brain injury, and they found that it performed better than 50 of the best neurosurgeons in the United States. So there are definite possibilities there, but it just needs to be regulated better. That fills me with a little more hope about AI. Now, Petra, I'm really sorry. I don't want to harangue you about your social robots, but I'm sure that there are some ethical issues that potentially surround that challenge. Yeah, and a lot of those are linked to some of the issues with AI. There's a lot of crossover there, similar ethical issues. One, for example, is privacy and what happens to our data um, in these sorts of circumstances. Um, for example, Amazon recently bought the um, company iRobot that owns the Roomba vacuum cleaner. And you know, while it does a great job of cleaning your house, it's also making a very perfect map of your home <laughs> and um, where all your stuff is. And of course, Amazon you know, has all sorts of other data um, about people, their reading habits, their, um, you know, what they buy, and so on, and they can put that together. So I guess um, privacy is one of the ethical issues that we need to think about um, when, when we're deploying these things. Thank you, Petra. So I want to move to technical challenges now, and I might throw to you first, Jacinta. <laughs> I'm sure that there's some technical challenges involved with the Internet of Energy. Well, like, why would you want it, right? Like, I made it sound really bad before. <laughs> but, like... One of the things I think we need to talk about with energy, um, especially when we move to renewables in the next couple of years, is that not only are we going to need like just the amount of energy that we have now, but renewable, we're also going to need significantly more energy for the stuff that is currently petrol that we're moving to electricity. Um, so, for example, to recharge an electric car, so this is from zero to 100, the, the electric vehicle scientist I talked to the other week would be like, you only have to recharge for 20 minutes to get the amount of stuff you do in a day. But assumedly, you're doing it from 0 to 100. Um, it uses the same energy that a small household uses each day. Yeah. Oh, so, wow. so if everyone switches to electric cars, you're going to need almost double the amount of energy that we use right now. Just full stop. That's a lot of energy. What do you do? Okay, so that means that we don't have to replace all of our current coal with renewables 
We also have to replace all the new energy. Um, but, you know, electric cars are actually a really good option for the Internet of Energy. <laughs> I brought it back. Um, so the way you would use that, for example, if you come home from work and you plug your car into your electric socket, at 6 p.m., that's when all of everybody is using all the energy, you know, to make dinner, to put your air con on, all those kind of things. However, it doesn't really matter if your electric car charges at 6 p.m. or at 4 a.m. when no one's using any energy. So if our devices are able to clock this change and go, energy's cheap now, I'm going to buy it now, it's better for everybody. Thank you. So I've got one more question about technical challenges. And now, Ellen, as a mathematician, I know that a nanometer is very, very small. Surely it's going to be hard to deal with things that are so small. What are the technical challenges surrounding your nanometric entities? I mean, you kind of illustrated the problem. We can't see what we're doing. <laughs> um, wavelengths of light are sort of four to 600 nanometers. So a lot of the work we're doing, you know, you can't get a microscope that good that doesn't exist except for electron microscopes, obviously, um, which is a different thing to wavelengths of light. Um, but yes, that is so much of the work that goes into kind of bench science is figuring out exactly what you have on you, what molecule you're using, what DNA you have. The amount of work that goes into analysing that, it's extraordinary that we can do a PCR test these days and get the results in a couple of hours. The amount of work that it took to get to that point is really, really notable. The conversation that I had that excited me the most this year was with, was with some scientists from the University of Tokyo who were working on marrying the um, sort of molecular models you see in the high schools, like ball and stick things, with electron microscopy. Because at the moment it's kind of, you know, you've got this nice clean coloured model and a grainy grey image. How do you connect those two things? And they talked about the age of cinematic chemistry, which is approaching. So the <laughs> idea that you might get in a movie, like someone puts a puts a thing into like a little box and it says, oh, this is this molecule. That doesn't exist right now, but it might within the next few decades. And that's something that really, really excites me. So it's like move over um, live stream game watching and we'll just watch some people do <laughs> some, some camp. 100%. I mean, you can get electron microscopes that. in yeah. schools. It's happening already like in a rentable model. You might just have more of those. Like Which a chemistry school? teacher could say, yeah. I love it. Live stream molecules of the future, mm. which is... Perfect segue into, I feel like I've been a bit of a naysayer enough. I want to move into a more positive light. What does the future look like for these fields? And again, because I was so mean, Evram, do you want to start? <laughs> I will start. Um, and I'll preface this by saying I gave a very impressive number at the beginning of my pitch um, about the, the amount of data on the internet. Um, but more data is better when it comes to artificial intelligence. Data is key. Um, and uh, healthcare is a very good example of this, actually. Um, what we want is more diverse data. We want data from different um, demographics uh, so that we can make better predictions and personalise medicine. Um, we also want you know, more uh, clinical trials, again, um, as I mentioned. Um, but of course, there are, there are the many, many areas um, which you know, I couldn't <laughs> rifle off, but we don't have time for that. Um, in which uh, AI is, is currently being used and will be used from self-driving cars to traffic control uh, and climate modelling, going back to you know, the issues that uh, Matt was raising. Um, but it also you know, has a place in pure science. Um, there was a very interesting uh, story which I came across uh, just a few weeks ago where um, an artificial intelligence tool was used to locate the very crater from which a meteorite uh, uh, was ejected from Mars and landed on Earth. Um, so, I mean, the, the opportunities are endless. And I think that that, for example, is a very um, interesting and possible harmless playground for, for testing AI and testing its capabilities before we start to put it into these more risque um, circumstances. It makes you much more comfortable. Thank you, Evelyn. <laughs> Emma, what does the future look like for citizen science? I hadn't heard of citizen science until a few years ago, yeah. and it's huge. It is, it is. Um, so I think piggybacking off what everyone was talking about with um, like analysing big data with AI and, and machine learning, that's all well and good, and computers are amazing. Um, but I think that citizen science and humans also have a role to play in analysing 
the kinds of data that we're going to be getting going into the future and that we should be getting because you know more data is better, we can be more informed. Um, so sometimes the human abilities, human brain's ability to recognise patterns and to be surprised by what we see is actually sometimes a little bit more like superior to just a computer algorithm. Um, something that pops to mind straight away uh, in citizen science is actually last year some citizen scientists who were involved in a project with NASA found a exoplanet, a gas giant outside of our solar system. It's, uh, it was kind of, a, you can think of it like an exoplanet Jupiter, around the same size. Um, and they found it in, like sort of meshed into this data that had come in from a satellite orbiting the Earth. And the algorithm that NASA had um, designed to look for them had completely missed it, whereas humans pinpointed it. So it was because this planet turned up in just a singular piece of data within millions of pieces of data. And this algorithm had been trained to find a pattern, um, whereas the humans were able to see this discrepancy. Uh, and a lot of hard work went into that, by the way. It wasn't just like a <laughs> eureka moment. They, they, it took some time. Um, on the other hand, uh, I also think that tapping into human creativity is another way that we can um, use citizen science to help further scientific research. So, um, did you say that before? Yeah, AIs aren't, yeah, they're not creative, but we are. We are, and we can do some really amazing things. Um, I was like, I, I didn't make a note of it, but yes. You're welcome. Segue, that was great. Um, so, there's a citizen science project, and it's online, so you can look it up, called Fold It. And basically, it's like this gamified version of a citizen science project where you can um, go online and figure out the way that a protein should fold into a three-dimensional structure and still be functional. And that sounds really fun. And it's actually really computationally demanding to try and do that because there are so many things going on within a protein. Um, and so many ways that it can fold up in three-dimensional space. But humans have really great three-dimensional spatial reasoning. We can puzzle it out. And with the Citizen Science Project, they actually uh, have, I think it was four instances where they had someone solve it <coughs> on the online game. They took that you know, amino acid sequence, the building block of a protein, got it grown up in some bacteria isolated the protein and looked at it and were like, actually, it looks exactly like how they thought it would look online. Um, so that'll have some really cool implications for like designing proteins in the future um, and you know, figuring stuff out on the computer first before going into the lab. Amazing, thank you, Emma. And very quickly, Petra, what is the future for those dumpling delivering robots that you so much about? <laughs> Oh my gosh, I think robots are going to be solving a lot more mundane problems than um, what Emma's just talked about. Um, I, I wrote about a study uh, that came out this week that looked at different ways um, people were either driving to the supermarket or getting their supermarket goods delivered. And it turned out that um, of all these different options, driving, delivery, drone delivery, the, the best in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, which is of course important um, in addressing climate change, was this little sidewalk robot which travels at a kind of walking pace um, <laughs> and is being piloted in cities in the US, in the UK and across Europe. Um, so as compared to what we used to do, which was drive there, that was the worst overall. Um, so, and, and that's what robots are for, you know, they're not for these kind of intelligent jobs, they're really good at doing these sort of mundane, repetitive tasks that maybe free up humans to be more creative, to do more, um, uh, do more with, with what we've got. 
doing the grunt work that we don't want to do. No, I love it. It's great. I also need someone to clean my bathroom. So um, the last thing, I just want to bring it back to humanity. So we've talked about the future, and I want to know how do these ideas help the challenges we face together as humanity? Emma, I'm just going to throw back to you really quickly because I feel like we come together when we do citizen science, and so you're yeah, the first person I'm going to pick so on. Right. Um, so I talked about maybe citizen science is key to analysing big, you know, big data, uh, but it's also important for collecting it. Um, so with the state of the world right now and in the coming decades, we have this intense need to really robustly monitor the planet and how it's going. We're going to be facing some really challenging social and environmental challenges going forward. Um, and, you know, uh, conventional scientific research maybe doesn't have the funding or uh, the number of people necessary to go out and collect that data. Um, so, especially for the long term, it needs to be done for a long time and over really large geographical areas. Um, so I think that's where citizen science is going to become really, really key um, moving forward. Um, for instance, uh, I was involved in a citizen science project back when I was at university. It's called Echidna CSI, um, and it's based <laughs> out of the University of Adelaide, so keep your eye out for that one online. Um, but it encourages people all across Australia to you know, go out and if you ever see an echidna, take a little snapshot of it and upload that uh, to the sightings. And I think they have over 11,000 sightings now. And that's really important for getting an idea of the distribution of these animals uh, because they're really cryptic and you know, we actually don't see them very often in our day-to-day -day life. Or you could maybe, and bear with me, see uh, and identify an echidna scat on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> They're actually really cool. If you break them open, you can, they glitter because they eat insects. <laughs> so the insects Please wash glitter. your hands after you've done it. So. <laughs> They're very dry. They're mostly dirt. Crushed up insects are uh, exoskeletons. Anyway, send that off and they can look at the DNA uh, that's left in, in those scats to see what are they eating, um, what's their health like. Um, and that in, information is so important so that we can get an accurate understanding of what's happening with the kidneys right now, how is it going to change over time, and how can we translate that research to actually helping them. Just so, can I do a really quick story about echidnas? Yeah. <laughs> Very so, quick. Um, Echidna uh, CSI, yeah. uh, they actually have a program. So I've seen some photos of that. And echidnas in bushfires, they bury themselves into the ground. And so they can lose their um, spikes. The spines. Yeah, so they lose their spikes. So you see these echidnas that have burnt spikes. They're completely fine. They come out of the ground after a bushfire. Just singed. Yeah, just did singed. Did you write and about they, that on Science I did, Alert? yeah. I wrote about I that on Science Alert. I was the one who did posted you? that on Science Alert. Real life excitement here at the science briefing, everyone. Oh my god! I love this, but we might have to move we'll on very quickly. We're running out of time, but let's just recreate this later on with a few more drinks. <laughs> Ellen, <laughs> how will the tiny things help humanity? Uh, we have a supply chain shortage. You don't need very much stuff to work with nanometers. <laughs> um, if your substance is ten thousand dollars a gram and you only need a milligram because you can modify its surface at the nan nano scale, then you need way less to work with it. So it's something that's going to change the world because you work with very very tiny amounts. Sorry, I stopped paying attention because I was trying to get someone else's attention. Um, just into your turn. Was it me? <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so um, I think so we're talking about the future of energy. Like, I think everyone knows it's really complicated. It's really like hard to get all these things in order, get all your ducks in a row. I'm going to talk about the duck curve, which is a thing that happens. Apparently, in, um, you have 20 seconds to talk about the duck curve. Okay, real quick. Um, graph of power production. It, it, it like it's higher during the middle of the day when the solar panels are out, right? However, the time we're using most of the energy is in the afternoon. How do you make that work, right? A couple of options. You can either use batteries, good batteries. I actually spoke about someone in the comment in the thing here, and we were talking about you know this exciting new type of battery. But you can also just use hydro power, where you like go up, 
in the day, it goes down at the night. Um, or instant electricity. You can use your electricity better in a better way and then you can be able to do it. We probably need all of those things, but having all of them is really exciting. I got really fast there. No, that was, and that was exactly <laughs> what I wanted. <laughs> now, we have completely run out of time, but I'm going to give... I have, we, we haven't heard from Claire and Matt for a little while, so you both have absolutely just 10 seconds to tell me exactly why your big idea is going to fix humanity. Thanks, Seth. <laughs> Please and thank you. Does TikTok even go to 10 seconds? I was going to talk about great things about STEM in third world countries, in developing countries. I was going to talk about the beryllium mirrors on Jade OST. I was going to be talking about extremophiles and finding them in like methane and hydrogen in moons. But the one thing I'm going to say is that we are so selfish. Uh, one of our things that drives us looking outwards is to ask who are we and what are we doing here and can we do our lives better? And I was talking to Lucinda earlier and she has this amazing thing at a hackathon. She was telling me about it and please just give me 10 seconds to explain this to you. No. Find her and get her to explain it to you. But basically, let's not create the problems that we have here, including our lack of diversity in science and everything else. Let's not create that on our planet B. Perfect. Matt, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, obviously, it's going to help humanity if we you know, mitigate the effects of bad things happening because we'll be alive. <laughs> <laughs> True. Requires people to actually band together to do that, and so I'll say, because I'm in it and you're in it, download the listener app, subscribe to the science briefing. There's going to be a podcast about space junk. You should listen to that so you get an idea of what people might need to do to, you know, avoid a big problem that is literally beyond our control now. Um, so it's not climate and vaccines and stuff like that. Space junk, yeah. So get the, listen, listen to the podcast. Yeah. On that note, thank you, everyone. Please remember that we'll have new episodes of the Science Briefing dropping every Tuesday and Thursday. Download the Listener app to listen for free. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's been fantastic. We hope you've enjoyed it.